Hello, I'm Toy Cat and welcome back to the second channel, Flying Video. Today I wanted to talk about airports because for most people around the world, it's just widely known that there is one airport for your city. Most people, when you say you're going to the airport, you're going to your city's one airport. Or maybe you're going to a neighboring city's airport, but it's just widely known what the airport means. However, for some bigger cities and some more visited cities, it turns out there's more than one airport. A lot of cities around the world have two airports, and some cities even have a third airport, or a fourth airport, or a sixth airport, or even in one case, there is seven airports for one metropolitan area and all of these airports serve slightly different purposes in these cases and I think because of that it'd be kind of interesting to talk about the different airports for major tourist destinations around the world so that if you're going to one of these places it functions kind of like travel advice but also uh, from like a city planning and like a getting people around perspective I find this fascinating and I hope you all do too so with that said I'm just going to quickly mention before we start anything uh, that there'll be a link to where I book hotels down below because a lot of people who want travel advice you might find that useful I'll explain what that's all about later but for now Let's dive straight into, uh, you know, Paris because we're going to start, oh, only commercial airports, places you can buy a ticket to at the end of this video, if you're so inclined. Again, you shouldn't fly to a place just because you like the airport, but maybe if you want to. And we're going to start with Paris and then go eastbound around the world with flights you can actually take, you know, like from airport to airport until we end up in London, which means we're going to be also giving a guide to the most indirect way you can fly from Paris to London if you really want to see it as that sort of an inconvenient guide. So yeah, that said, let's dive into Paris's airports. We're starting with Paris because it is one of the most visited cities in the world and the most visited country in the world, and it has three separate airports that are fairly easy to summarize. So we've got Paris Charles de Gaulle at first, which is the airport you'll probably land in if you're flying to Paris from another continent, because Paris Charles de Gaulle is the second biggest airport in Europe and serves most of the traffic from, uh, you know, if you want to fly into uh, Paris from Tokyo, you'll fly into uh, Charles de Gaulle. Want to fly into Paris from anywhere in America, you'll fly into Charles de Gaulle, most likely. Again, in most cases, uh, there are weird exceptions. Uh, and although they have a, a, a domestic and a European flight network, it's not anywhere near as big as uh, you know the one found in other airports, such as uh, the second airport we're going to be talking about, which is Paris ORY Airport. So I will admit I'm going to be saying this one wrong because look at the name of this airport. Tell me how you want to say that. I know, I know, I know it's French, but I just read it as Paris O'Reilly Airport. So to not upset people, I'll call it Paris ORY Airport. It's official uh, three-letter code, and uh, this is the domestic airport for Paris. It's slightly closer to Paris. Uh, it does serve of some other really weird destinations, such as there's a low-cost business airline that flies to America. Uh, there are flights to South America from that. There's a lot of weird uh, ones, but it is uh, France's largest domestic airport. Most domestic air uh, travel within France ends up in Paris ORY and uh, yeah it's also slightly closer to the city uh, than Charles de Gaulle is in terms of pure distance. Also it serves the south a little bit better. So with that said uh, there is a third airport. Oh also there's a fourth airport but we're not talking about it for reasons because it's all the way. Okay let's talk about it actually. Let's just just so I can complain about how like you know what? this shouldn't count as an airport for the video but it's going to. There's an airport all the way in Chalons and Champagne and again bad fr uh, uh, French right there but they've got got literally one, I mean first of all look at the distance from this uh, all the way to Paris, it's like really over 100, almost 150 kilometers, it's like a similar distance from Luxembourg City, uh, pretty much the same actually. Second of all is the fact that they have literally two flights, they're both Ryanair flights that are marketed as to Paris, um, but they're only from uh, Fez seasonally, so not even all the time from Fez, and all year round from Marrakesh in Morocco, which to me is like you know if you're only flying to Morocco let's not count that because none of you watching this video are flying from Morocco to Paris. And if you are, I apologize, but you're not, so I'm not going to apologize. So with that said, let's talk about the third actual major airport that Paris does have that has more than two flights, both from Ryanair and barely to the city we're talking about, because there is a third airport, and to show the distance of it, here is Paris, here's Paris Charles de Gaulle, here's Paris ORY, you can see they're kind of similar distances, and then there's Paris Beauvais all the way up there where it's like, ah, well that's that's a bit different, isn't it? And uh, yeah, long story short, this is the budget uh, you know, like, I guess, airline uh, choice. It's most uh, frequented by Ryanair. Again, in a, in a lot of places, Ryanair has this bad reputation for flying to uh, cities, uh, airports outside the city. And in the case of Paris, this is very true. It's over an hour and a half by bus. There's no proper link from here uh, to the city. However, it is going to be a lot cheaper. And if you want to save on, rather than going to the very expensive, uh, usually Paris Charles de Gaulle flights with Air France, then take a budget flight to uh, Beauvais and just accept that there's a 90 minute extra time basically on the flight in exchange for going there. Also, uh, because it's a low cost uh, airport, it obviously is a little bit less nice on the inside. And that's a common theme that you might see as we go forward into the second city, 
uh, and all the ones after that, because Berlin has three airports also, except it's kind of more like two and a half, in the same way in Paris it's like three and a half. It's like two and a half in Berlin that you might not even want to count that way, because Berlin has two separate airports right now that function that you can fly to. We've got Berlin Tegel Airport, uh, this is the airport uh, that they had to construct because after the Berlin airlift they realized we need more air capacity for West Berlin. So it's kind of West Berlin's former airport. And then we've got East Berlin's former airport, which is just outside, by the way, the boundaries of... Um it's just outside the boundaries for, uh, you know, Brand uh, of uh, Berlin. It's technically in Brandenburg, partially, and some of their runway is actually inside the city of Berlin. You can see the line uh, right over here. Here's Berlin, and there's Brandenburg, so you can see how, like, uh, it, it, it's interesting to me uh, that, like, it's just outside the city and technically in a separate state of Germany. Uh, but this is, uh, funnily enough, you know, this is the East German airport. This is the West German one. The West German airport is the, the nice one, the one the major carriers fly to, and also EasyJet, because they're, like, on that top tier of budget airlines for confusing reasons. And then this is the budget airline airport where EasyJet also flies to, <laughs> I believe, um, as well as a lot of other uh, budget carriers. And yeah, it's the interesting uh, kind of mixture of like budget and main, except there's a third airport, except the, so there's a third airport, it's called Berlin Brandenburg Airport, and it was meant to open in 2011. It was meant to look like this. It's named after Willy Brandt, one of uh, Germany's most uh, influential chancellors, and uh, you know, kind of like Charles de Gaulle, or you know, like JFK or whatever. Uh, but the interesting thing about this airport, in my opinion, is that they're building it on, on the place of the former low-cost airport. So the low-cost airport, which is connected horrifically to Berlin, by the way, you have to take separate chain, train change, they're sad trains. They're, again, this is the East Berlin airport, and you could tell because it's a lot sadder than the other one. Uh, but yeah, the interesting thing is they're building Brandenburg Airport, the great airport that's gonna shut down the other two, right here. Meant to open in 2011, then they pushed it to 2019. And you know that where that thing happens, where they say a date, and then as the date approaches, they're like, ah, we should push that date back. Uh, it, it keeps happening. It's like with me and live streaming, where I'm just like, you know, an extra minute would be fine, except in their case, an extra year, who's caring about it? So yeah, the plan is to shut down the current two and open this third one, although that kind of also is the second one. It's a very confusing thing that just isn't going ahead. It's one of those just projects from hell that just isn't being finished. It is gonna be great when it's done. They built a whole new set of things. Uh, however, right now, even though it should have opened six years ago, I f uh, seven years ago, I flew in there recently, and the only thing that's changed to kind of convert Schoenfeld into uh, uh, <laughs> uh, the Berlin Brandenburg Airport is that they've got the um, the things that divide lines. You know, you make lines by zipping them onto poles. Those things now say Berlin Brandenburg Airport. That is the only <laughs> change I've noticed, despite having a lot of years of development. Uh, because honestly, Berlin is a city. Uh, you know, it used to be two cities that kind of just combined into one. And uh, one of the parts of that they want to have is combining their airports into one. But they're doing a very bad job at it. Side note, by the way, Berlin. It is one of the most popular cities to visit in Germany, but I wouldn't recommend it as much. You know, the capital city of most countries is like, oh yes, the culture, the everything about it. And you get a little bit of that in Berlin, but it's not as nice as most capital cities. Has to be said, again, I liked it. I would, I want to go again, but I wouldn't recommend it as much as most other capital cities. Uh, even, even Warsaw, I'm like, you know, yeah, a little, little bit of a half and half. So with that said, let's move on to the next city. We're gonna fly west again, so you can fly from Berlin to Moscow if you want to, or Moscow. Uh, the, it's, it, it, I was so confused for the longest time why everyone said Moscow, and I realized, oh, it's uh, Americanism versus the Britishism. Uh, so Moscow, or as me and my friend, because when we went there, I went with a friend, uh, used to like to call it Mokba, because in Cyrillic, it's Mok and then a B, N, and A, but it's not B, N, and A, it's Cyrillic, it sounds entirely different, but we're gonna say it that anyway. So uh, yeah, Moscow has four airports, and it bugs the trend you've seen so far. It's like major airport, kind of regional airport, Budget air airport, maybe mix those things up. Uh, because Moscow has four airports. We've got uh, the biggest airport in the whole country, which is SVO. The, it's found up here, and it's a little bit further than the city than the other three. Uh, and then we've got a second major airport. Uh, I'm not going to even try to say it. This is DME Airport, found just over here. And um, again, a little bit to the south of the city. Again, similar distances, but DME is a little bit closer. And then we've got a third airport, which is found just over here. This is the one uh, used by heads of state, but also some uh, Aeroflot flights, like major flights go into there. And then we've got a fourth airport, which is for budget carriers, which hasn't really taken off yet. So Moscow has four airports, but the interesting thing is unlike, um, you know, both Paris and Berlin, where like there's huge distant gaps, they're all pretty much the same distance from the center uh, to just kind of like, again, to, to, to do this all at once. So this is 18 kilometers. This is uh, 40 kilometers. That's not the same amount at all. 
That was 38, that's why. <laughs> this is 40 kilometers, and then we've got over here um, to the one heads of state use. It's a little bit closer, it's the closest, but it's still 27. And then if we go to uh, Sheramenta, or SVO, like we'll call it, to say face some pronunciation, uh, you can see how it's a very similar distance too. They're all within about 10 kilometers of each other, which is unheard of for major airports in a major city. There's not a budget airport either, uh, really, like that's really far out from the city. Uh, but they do all serve different purposes. So uh, this airport is mostly for heads of state and also flights within Russia by Aeroflot, but then other airlines operate from there sometimes and it's an emergency airport for other ones. Uh, this is just the big one, the catch-all fly there if you're an airline airport. Then we've got DME Airport, which serves, again, interesting purposes. Basically, long story short, Moscow has four airports and unlike other cities where you can like categorize them very easily, it's more a bit like, oh, they're all kind of close and they're all kind of good. Fly to the one that's cheapest, you, you might not notice it really. I mean, SVO is obviously the nicest, but I mean like VKO has its own, yeah, anyway, every airport has its own nice things going on. Keep that in mind in Moscow, as we fly from Moscow to the most visited city in the world, this is gonna be an important one if it does come up, because Thailand is a, a, a pretty interesting country, because unlike the rest of the ones on this list, it's not a major power, but Bangkok is a major tourism hub. In fact, it's the most visited city, and I'd like to know. I'm going to Bangkok, so maybe if I experience it, I'll be like, wow, this deserves to be the most visited city, and maybe word of mouth is just that good. But I don't know why Bangkok is the most visited tourist city in the world. It doesn't seem like it has everything that a tourist city should have, but it's the most visited city in the world, just in total, if you understand why, let me know. However, it has two airports, and you might know, uh, there's BKK Airport, the one you probably fly into from another country. Uh, this is, again, not gonna not gonna even try and do it, but it's, there's this airport right here. And then to the north of it, you've got Dong Wang Airport, which is the budget carrier. However, I like the story behind these two because uh, it's worth keeping in mind uh, that uh, Dong Wang Airport is actually the busiest airport of any budget carrier airport in the world that's solely uh, covers budget airlines and it also used to be their main airport the way Thailand developed the way Bangkok developed is they had one airport here Which is like I think it's the oldest uh, International airport in Asia more fun facts for you just fun facts all day it seems uh, so the oldest international airport in Asia used to be Bangkok's major air hub they you fly into Dong Wang, which is Bangkok's airport, and then they uh, were gonna demolish it and start up a new better airport to the south in a better location, and then they decided to keep both in the end. And I thought that was an interesting little change. And uh, yeah, so because of that, there's two airports. They're both pretty similar distances, but one is a lot more retro on the inside. <laughs> there's a good word for it. And one is a more major one. So yeah, with that said, two, uh, you know, major airports for one major city. Uh, they both are huge in terms of passenger traffic. And also, if you want to fly from Asia and then fly around it, flying into Bangkok is usually the best deal. Um, like I said, I, I'm flying with uh, one of the best airlines in the world. It was less than 400 from the UK, um, which for like at the time we booked it with a certain number of people. Weird conditions via Qatar. It was a really like particularly good deal. But all the time, especially if you're doing business or premium or whatever, Bangkok is just the, uh, the city for good deals because everyone from around the world wants to go there. So airlines have so much capacity. If, a, if an airline has an A380, they probably fly it to uh, Bangkok. That's interesting by itself. But I want to know, if you know the root cause of why Bangkok is such a widely visited city, because all the rest of the ones on the list, like, oh, the second most visited city, London, makes sense, right? Uh, or like a Hong Kong, or I guess that makes sense. Or like New York, they all make sense as visited cities because they're from a major power. But Bangkok is just like, uh, how did it get so big? And I've looked into it before and I've never found a satisfactory answer. Please tell me. Also, if you're a Bangkok export, expert, email me. <laughs> If you're a Bangkok export too, please do email me as well at ibx2cat at gmail.com because I uh, am going in literally a week now and I'd love to know if you've got any like pro tips or whatever or if you live in Bangkok or in Bangkok next week, let me know and give me, give me, just give me all your tips. Like I, I really love, I did this before when I went to New Zealand and also uh, when I went to Singapore for the first time and I love the advice and the the, the meetups I did there. So if you live there, you want to meet for like a drink or something, let me know. With that said though, uh, that is uh, Bangkok and the airports it has. Very weird city with two airports, uh, which is a common trend as we move into Tokyo. Tokyo is another city, which is one that you would, it would make sense if it's in the top uh, most visited cities, because it is. And it makes sense if it was number one, which it isn't. But Tokyo is a city which everyone wants to go to, right? Because it's the biggest city metropolitan area. It's the biggest, I think, urban area in the world. There's like 35 million people living in one kind of continuous area. It's insane. 
Uh, and even though Japan is really struggling with a declining population, Tokyo is not struggling this like this. So how, do, how is Tokyo served internationally? Two airports. They've got, uh, they've got the more traditional airport, or I guess kind of the other way around. They've got a former domestic airport, which now does international. Uh, we've got Haneda Airport over here. Uh, Tokyo Haneda, HND Airport, and then we've got Tokyo Narita Airport all the way over here. And you might think there's a distant, uh, different scat between them, because when I first heard about them, because I flew in Haneda the first time I went to Tokyo, I was like, oh, so it's uh, 15 kilometers to one and 15 kilometers to the other. It's 15 kilometers to Haneda and it's 50 kilometers to Narita. So it's one of those far out for city airports, but there isn't a budget and non-budget airport here. In fact, Tokyo, uh, Japan is kind of unique in that it doesn't really do budget airports very much slash at all. Uh, in fact, pretty much everyone at their airports is divided by like, uh, I guess, domestic, international. That's the only real divide you're going to find. So yeah, uh, Tokyo Narita Airport is uh, the one that used to be mostly international, has more international traffic, but nowadays more airlines choose to fly into Haneda. And the advice right here is just like, you know, both realistically, there, there's no real difference in the services you'll get because both, uh, both, both airports are widely served by a wide range of airlines. Uh, for instance, British Airways flies into Haneda, but lots of other European airlines fly into Narita. Japan Airlines flies from both, if I'm not mistaken, um, like to Europe. If I'm, uh, so yeah, with that said, just keep that in mind that like, it really depends on like, it, you don't wanna really go to one or the other if it's more expensive, because they'll both get you there in similar distances of time. And yeah, with that said, let's talk about how you get from them to the city, because I know I've gone very briefly over some of these, like, oh, this one's further away and takes some more time. But in this case, it's not actually that much more to get from uh, Narita to the center than it is to get from to uh, from uh, Haneda. So here's the thing you gotta keep in mind. Uh, Haneda Airport is you, you take a monorail and then you take like a train and then you're anywhere in the Tokyo center you wanna be. And uh, the monorail is really cool. In fact, actually, let me show you something because uh, here is my Google Photos. I searched Tokyo train and it somehow knows every single photo of, of trains I took in Japan. It's like, yep, you want those, don't you? Near Tokyo, I guess. Uh, and so you can see like, wow, look, they've got Animal Crossing things on the wall. Or like, oh, look, here's one of those videos I made on this, oh, you can't see it, on this channel. Uh, and they, they've got a monorail, which is crazy cool by itself, right? Oh, they've also got, a, and it, I, I just said uh, Google Photos is cool, but they've, they've categorized this German ICE as a Tokyo train. Anyway, so as you can see, we've got the, the Tokyo monorail, which is kind of cool by itself. Look on the inside. This is a cool way to design, design a, uh, you know, a monorail if people are going from the airport. However, however, uh, if we go back for a second to uh, Narita, Narita has something called the Narita Express or the Nex. And I don't care much about trains. I, I guess I do, as I've shown on this channel. However, one of the things that I think is just the coolest is the Narita Express or the Nex, because this is what it looks like. This is the Nex. It looks like a crazy cyborg robot train that's like, it's an artificial intelligence design just to deliver you safely to your destination. I don't know why this train looks so cool. I, again, most trains in the world, they're not exciting in the slightest. It's just, they're just trains, right? But this train looks cool. It's like, yeah, I'm gonna do some things. I'm a robot cool train. And that's what I love about Japan, just to go on a side Japan note, because you know what, you can't stop me. Uh, I, I love that like, Japan gets you excited about the small things. Uh, to, to go back to this small thing, every single station has its own little jingle to it. So. I'm sure one of these videos uh, shows it. Okay, this is just a weird video of me on the Tokyo Metro. It's fine for a call in public there, it's fine. So, as you can see, I get off from the train to the station, and you know what happens? It's the same noise as before. You know what happens? It plays a little song. Wait. Maybe it doesn't play a song. I think it did play, okay, wait. There we go. <laughs> anyway, long story short, Japan, I think the f I, I realized it recently. The thing that they do right is they get you like, they make everything just a little bit better. They design it a little bit better. And you know what, good design is a good thing. Speaking of good design, I just wanna finish off Tokyo here cause I'm like being a Japan fanboy at this point. Um, but yeah, so Tokyo has two airports and these aren't only the two airports for Tokyo. They're the only two airports for Yokohama, which is a separate city. I mean, it's basically in the Tokyo uh, metropolitan area, uh, but also, Interestingly enough, because it's Japan still, Japan has some of the most expensive landing fees for anywhere in the world. So in the same way, Bangkok is one of the cheapest airports to always fly into. Tokyo is usually one of the most expensive. So pro tip, fly into another Asian city, then maybe get a budget flight to Tokyo if it works out cheaper. Again, look into it. But um, let's talk about the fact that Osaka, um, you know, even if, you, if you're flying into Kyoto or maybe even Osaka itself, Osaka has two airports. They have Osaka International Airport, which is up, it's near Inetami, and uh, it doesn't have any international flights, so you can't actually fly there. It's called Osaka International Airport, but don't tell Tokyo how to name their stuff, or Japan, sorry. Uh, but then they've got the one which is actually their international airport, 
This is Kansai Airport, the international airport that's not called an international airport. And it is, they built an island just to make this airport. That's kind of cool. It's the most expensive airport that's ever been made in the world. Kind of cool. Um, but the other wild thing about it is the fact that because it's so far out from Osaka, and especially if you're going to Kyoto, if you want to go to Kyoto, it might be worth looking into flying into Tokyo, you know, because then you get to see Tokyo on the way, and then taking the two and a bit hour train to Kyoto, uh, rather than, you know, getting on the Osaka. Uh, it's called the express train, but it takes an hour to get to Osaka, and then you've got to change and do some other stuff to get to Kyoto, or you take a two and a half hour bus. Uh, they're called airport limousines. Uh, long, long story short, in the same reverse way uh, of a few other cities we'll talk about, where you fly into somewhere else to go somewhere, in Japan, it's better to fly into somewhere to go somewhere else. I hope that makes sense. If not, then let's move on to the next city, because you can fly from both Haneda and Narita to New York. Actually, I think it's just from Narita to New York. So, yeah, with that said, um, if you fly into New York, you know there's two major options, right? There's there's two big ones. Uh, there's JFK, the most famous, I think one of the most famous airports in the world, perhaps. Um, JFK Airport is right here. It's named after John F. Kennedy. And I think actually in a lot of conversations, JFK, ref like, you know, the airport is more famous than the person in some ways. Uh, but anyway, it's New York's airport airport. You're flying into New York from London, from Paris, from Japan, from any of these places, you're gonna fly into JFK, John F. Kennedy International Airport. Easy. But then the second airport, that New York has makes things a bit more confusing because they have Newark Liberty International Airport. It's also an international airport, also does some domestic stuff, but like it's an international airport that you might fly into from London, from Paris, maybe from Japan somewhere or Asia. And um, yeah, it's not actually in New York, but it's closer to New York City and Manhattan than uh, JFK is. JFK is closer for Queens and Brooklyn people and uh, obviously Newark is closer for Manhattan people, which is what most people care about in the city, which means that the closest airport that's major and international, if you wanna fly in to New York City, is the one in New Jersey, a different state entirely. So that's confusing enough by itself, but let's talk about the third major airport most people know when they talk about New York, because there is, of course, uh, this airport right here, um, LaGuardia Airport. It's named after a famous New York mayor because you know what? They, may, they, they just name airports after people here. It's just their thing. So LaGuardia Airport is really uh, a <laughs> the most convenient airport for Manhattan people if you're flying from within the US. They don't do international flights. It's not an international airport. So as you can see, if we do a little, little distance thing, wow, look how close it is. It's only uh, less than 10 kilometers to get there and it can take about a 20 minute taxi. Boom, you're in New York. So Here's the interesting thing about just these three airports, because there's four more airports we've got to go through, because I hate my life. Actually, let's go through them now. Uh, get get the hate my life out of the way. Uh, so there is four other airports for the New York metropolitan area that you might fly into if you're flying into New York. So uh, first of all here, we're going to talk about uh, the Long Island Airport, because Long Island has its own airport, MacArthur Airport. Again, we, we love naming things after people here. Um, this is Long Island MacArthur Airport. They mostly just do a few budget flights around America. If you live on Long Island, it might be convenient. Again, but it is technically a New York metropolitan area airport, so we're counting it today. Then we've got White Plains Airport, which is what it's known domestically within the US, uh, but it does count as one of the New York metropolitan area airports. So they've got Westchester County Airport. And if, if your cheapest flight is to Westchester, take the hour ride from you know White Plains into New York, boom, save yourself some money. And given how expensive flying within the US is, it's the most expensive domestic country to fly in. Like flying into the US is often cheaper than flying within the US. So pro tip, if you live in the US, you're screwed. Um, <laughs> not really a pro tip more than just uh, the more you know, I guess. Um, then we've of course got um, Stewart International Airport, uh, which I always forget its location because it's in a, there we go, it's all the way up here. It's, <laughs> you know how that last one looked kind of far away? This is New York Stewart International Airport. And it is, so by the way, it's named after another person, uh, Stewart, but in, uh, uh, just just do it, you know, still a little. Uh, but yeah, basically, if you want to get from here to there, it's an hour and a half, by the way. Uh, it's mostly used by internal domestic uh, US budget flights, with the exceptions uh, being the fact that Norwegian flies there from various UK, no, but British Isles destinations. They fly from Belfast and also from Dublin, I want to say, uh, to there, as well as they used to fly from Edinburgh, but not anymore. Why do they do this? Uh, because it's a cheap airport for landing fees and they fly 737s and it, it's a weird thing But if you want to fly into an indirect New York airport, you can go from there They market it as New York City and that's a thing and that's airport number six in the airport You think we're done? No, New York has seven airports that all technically serve the same metropolitan area So next up we're gonna talk about Trenton, which is um, 
this, <laughs> the distances are always quite shocking in this one, because this is Trenton right here, and this is Trenton Mercer Airport. So, Trenton Mercer Airport, small airport, mostly served by regional domestic budget carriers, but with that said, it is an airport in the New York metropolitan area that you might choose to fly into to fly into New York City. And these all count, by the way. The reason I'm counting all of these, even though it looks like, why is Trenton closer to Philadelphia? According to the, I think it's the IATA, it counts as a New York airport. It's in the, it, it, it can call itself a New York airport, uh, legally and officially, which is interesting if you ask me. So seven airports, but if we're being honest, even though the fourth one is international and you might fly in there with Norwegian and you will get a good deal, Let's pretend that Newburg, uh, Stuart International, it's Newburg, that's the name of the place. It's such a weird, like, everything. But yeah, uh, even though you might do that, let's assume you're flying to one of the other three airports instead. The main three, uh, because the interesting thing about these three, just for a little bit of airport nerdery on you, is the fact that uh, there are three main airports. There's two big airports which serve most people, and then there's a third airport, Legard, so uh, there's JFK, a big airport, one of the biggest in the world, uh, not, not like hugely, but it's, it's big. Uh, then we've got Newark, and then we've got LaGuardia. LaGuardia, though, is really interesting because it's only used for domestic US flights, and not many of them, and they're expensive. So, uh, here's the thing about LaGuardia. It, the, New York is known for infamous, tra uh, you know, like, air traffic delays, and the reason is entirely down... By the way, there's another airport there. It's general aviation. Sorry, I interrupt my point, but in case anyone is like, there's another airport. No, these we're only talking about commercial aviation. You can buy flights to and from there. So, anyway, LaGuardia is only used by a very small proportion of the people, but it causes a very big proportion of the air instance because New York is just known for delays. It's the most delayed uh, city in like the developed world, as far as I'm aware, because uh, there are three major airports, all with huge airspace areas that overlap with each other. And the biggest problem with that is the fact that when one gets delayed, it causes delays into the other's airspace, into the other's airspace, and when they're all pretty busy airports, boom, everything's a problem. Your flight's delayed by an hour and a half, you're stuck on the plane, you're hot, you just want to take off, but you can't because you're in New York. And the biggest reason behind this is because LaGuardia is actually uh, kind of like in between the other two circles. If you take away LaGuardia, then the other two circles don't have to in you know, intercept, or they can be bigger and less likely to cause problems for each other. So, why does LaGuardia still exist? And this is my favorite example of like, uh, you know, America is a country that really loves, really, really loves to like complain about the government literally all the time, right? However, they have a lot of really weird government-controlled industries that other countries have all agreed like, yeah, that's that makes sense being private, like airports, all of uh, America's airports, with a couple of exceptions, are owned by the government. So, because it's owned by the government, specifically the politicians of New York, the politicians of New York, by the way, who live in Manhattan and find it very convenient, even though it's the best solution to just close it and to send the capacity to the other airports, they don't want that in the slightest. They, they think that's not a great solution because then they lose their convenient airport. And that is an example of why politics and airports should not come together. I guess another example around the world. And it's just funniest to me that it happens in America. Like of all places, a place that's like, yeah, freedom, capitalism. Oh yeah, but not airports. No capitalism for airports. You better take that away. And funny enough actually, because of the, uh, the fact that most airports are government owned is one of the reasons why flying in America is so expensive. So next time you have a $200 air ticket to go literally, uh, you know, 600 miles or something, I guess blame, I, I don't know, politicians. I don't know what that said though. Let's move on to the final example because we're here in London now. We've flown all of these air flights in a row because we didn't want to fly from Paris direct to London. We wanted to go through all those other countries. So now you're in London, which of the six airports are you going to land on or fly from? So interesting enough, you're most likely to go to Heathrow Airport. No Heathrow rant today. Don't worry, I got you covered. None of that today. However, what I am going to talk about is the other five airports a little bit because Heathrow's biggest airport. Statistically speaking, if you fly into London, you're flying into Heathrow. It covers about half of the total volume of uh, flights of all of the area, and it's the long haul destination with a short haul route network from British Airways that's expensive and not widely used uh, by itself. It's usually used for connecting flights onto America. It's kind of the gateway between the world and, uh, you know, like Europe, but also the world and London, but also Europe and sometimes uh, America. It's a weird combination of things. But let's talk about the other airports, because that's the biggest one, and I've gone on a huge rant about it. <laughs> People were not happy about that. So we'll talk about the second airport. So you can kind of, by the way, uh, see just how much of a big uh, footprint having six airports leaves on the UK, because we've got the second biggest airport in Crawley, uh, or at least that's what my phone says when you do the automatic location, uh, because Gatwick Airport 
is this airport right here. It is uh, the world's biggest single runway operating airport in terms of uh, passenger volume. So there's a fun fact for you. It has two runways, you can clearly see, but they're only allowed to operate one at a time. They shut one down sometimes to use the other one if there's an accident or something. And there you go, fun fact about uh, Gatwick. Uh, but it, because uh, it's the second biggest airport and it's used by a weird mixture of budget-ish carriers and British Airways, you know, the major, technically speaking, a full service carrier, but they're really a budget full service carrier. Um, it's used by a weird mixture of those. So it's kind of like a halfway house between budget and full service. And it's uh, used for some flights to places like the Caribbean, you know, jet setter flights. It's used for non-business flights. If it's a flight that is primarily for leisure, probably goes from Gatwick. So for instance, Amsterdam, although you can fly from Heathrow because it's also a businessy city. Uh, Gatwick, you can fly to Amsterdam. Gatwick, you can fly to the Spanish islands. Gatwick, you can fly uh, to the Caribbean islands. And it's also where Norwegian has their long haul uh, budget network from, uh, to and from. So if you wanna fly to America for $139, you'll fly into Gatwick Airport. Boom, with that said though, let's move on to the third busiest airport in the London airport. We've got six to go for, it's, it's great fun. Um, because the sixth biggest airport in the area uh, is actually Stansted Airport. So London Stansted Airport, I, most people in the UK call it Stansted Airport. Same with Gatwick actually, uh, we just call them the second part. Fun fact, maybe you didn't know. Stansted Airport is uh, this airport right here, another single runway airport, and it's mostly used by budget carriers. I technically have to say mostly used by budget carriers because although it's mostly used by budget carriers, there is an Emirates flight there for some reason. Emirates flies to both Gatwick and Heathrow as well. They also fly to Stansted for reasons. <laughs> and yeah, so they fly to Stansted. Interesting little fun fact you might not be aware of. And uh, also, it's just most used for budget. They're one of the most efficient airports at cutting costs. So a lot of Ryanair's very cheapest flights will come from here, as well as a lot of other uh, competitors. It's mostly Ryanair, but they, uh, other airlines do have a presence. And in a similar vein to that, the fourth biggest airport in Luton, which is currently under renovations. Oh, did I? Did you see that? It like. It was, oh, I'm going there on the 3rd of October at 8.50. I was like, do I have reservations? I do have reservations. So I'm going to London Luton Airport very soon. <laughs> I genuinely didn't realize I was going to Luton. I thought I was going to Stansted. I realized something new about my life. Fun fact, by the way, Google does that. It'll probably tell me my flight back, uh, by the way. But anyway, so London Luton Airport is an airport in London, but really in Luton. <laughs> <laughs> so much information. So, no, uh, London Airport is one of the weirder, slightly more inconvenient airports to get to, and it serves mostly budget traffic, mostly EasyJet though. In fact, it serves EasyJet so much that if you zoom in really close, you can see their logo <laughs> on, the, uh, on the building because that's what they've done, which I think is kind of nice, also kind of awful, but also kind of nice. So, yeah, this is the EasyJet dominated airport. You will find Ryanair flights from there, you will find Wizz Air flights from there. I think El Al, the, uh, El Al, I don't know how you say it, but the, the Israeli, uh, national carrier flies here. I've never worked out why. It's just one of those oddities like the Emirates Stansted flight. Like, ah, I guess they do that, don't they? And yeah, London Luton Airport, the mostly budget uh, uh, airport that is slowly, I guess, trying to improve itself. It's awful on the inside. I've done a flight video thing through there, the 199 Ryanair flight. And they're also gonna be connecting up the airport to the train station with light rail at some unknown future point. Also, the University of Bedfordshire is right next to it as well. Isn't that delightful? So next up, we've got London City Airport, uh, because London City Airport is the actual London airport. You know, all of these other airports are well out of it in the same way New York had the same problem. Uh, however, London City Airport is the most expensive to fly into and only serves European destinations and can only serve so much traffic in a day because of noise constraints and because of it's literally an airport with a runway this size. It's not big enough for a full, uh, air, a full 737 or A320 to take off. Uh, even an A319, they have one flight with one of those and they have to take off and then refuel on the way out. It's Long story short, it's a very short runway. It's a very small airport. Can only ever be a regional airport if you want to get into London City. Real quick, you can do that because Canary Wharf, the heart of London business, do you want to know how far it is? It's literally four kilometers. Uh, if you're going into London and the, the flight is just as cheap as London City, go in there. However, it never will be and the airport is in this perpetual state of like being very underused. Oh, also, it has a first class terminal you can pay to use. Like there's no first class tickets you can buy from there, but there is a terminal you can pay 149 pounds or something and they'll drive you to your plane. Don't don't ask me why you would want that or why that's cool. Uh, Cause they, they don't have any lounges for any passengers of any uh, variety. Finally, we've got London South End Airport, which is, it, you know, okay, so all these places, it's like, oh man, look how far Stansted out, it's all the way up there. And then we've got South End, on the sea, by the way. Uh, so I'm just gonna type in 
uh, South End Airport right here, because I actually, I always forget where it actually is. South End Airport. It is an airport that is trying to establish itself as a new London airport. It only got the tag of London South End Airport in 2014. Again, there's like a whole process you have to apply for to become a London or a Paris or a New York airport. This is London South End Airport, and it's used for flights to, like budget flights again, but a very small number of them. It's a tiny, tiny, tiny airport, and uh, it's eventually going to be used for domestic flights within the UK as well. They're trying to launch that up, do some weird domestic flights from in out of here. Uh, would it grow? Who knows at some point, but it's it's horrifically connected. Try not to go there if you can avoid it because it's a tiny airport, like painfully tiny, uh, and they don't fly to many places. They don't to fly to too many places. And uh, also, it's awful. Have I mentioned how much I don't like London South End Airport? I think I have enough. So yeah, that is six airports for London, seven airports for New York. I don't know why it's being super slow today. Uh, seven airports for New York, uh, three airports-ish for Berlin, four airports for Moscow, two airports for Paris and for Bangkok. And now you know a little bit more about the world of flying. It just took you 35 minutes of your life. I'm sorry, second channel. I've got to, I, I want to get a little bit more compact with all these sorts of things. But it's just like, you know, I want to give the fun facts. I want to talk about the Narita Express. It's a train. It's a train robot. Look at it. How can you not want to be around that? But yeah, I hope you all enjoyed the video. Let me know what you thought. Comments down below. I'm, I'm, I'll try and be faster or slower or more concise, more information dense. But I, again, I'm also trying to slow down the delivery so you can understand the words. Let me know what you think about all those things. Also on the Reddit, you can maybe do that. But before I go, I want to quickly just let you know about Hotels.com because a lot of people ask for travel advice all the time. And I'm still working on the travel guide, by the way. It's a big document that like, I'm just trying to throw in actual advice all the time. But one of the biggest advice is like, okay, if you go anywhere, book a hotel. What booking site do you use? And most, most travel vloggers will be like, use booking.com and make sure you use referral code uh, you know, seven to say 3% off. However, the consistently best site I always use is hotels.com. So I will clarify, there's a link in the description. If you use it to make a booking, I think I get some, it's like 7% maybe, uh, like off as a commission or whatever. So, you know, I get paid if you use that link. So if you want to use that, book a hotel, it's fine. But the reason I'm recommending it is because booking.com has the same deal where you can recommend people use it and they give you a lot more but I recommend Hotels.com instead because they give you effectively 10% off every hotel. You don't need to look around and find a 7% off booking discount. No, if you book 10 hotels, they uh, when, when you book every 10 hotels, they average out the value of that and give you a free hotel stay. For every 10 hotels you stay in, you get one for free on the average. So it's effectively 10% cash back, which is great. I, I love that personally. Like every now and then you stay for free. It's a way better system than getting 7% off. Cause like what is 7% off a 70 pound hotel, hotel stay? Like four pounds 90, you don't notice it. Getting a free hotel stay, which I've done, I think three times in the past year. That's cool. That's, I like that. That's awesome, and that's why I recommend Hotels.com. Um, even if you don't use my affiliate link, I'd like it if you did, but if you feel like it's evil or tainted in some way if you do, that's a thing. And yeah, I wanna just do a few sponsorship things like that, so you'll, you'll probably see it at the end of another video at some point. But yeah, real travel advice for Toycat, Hotels.com for uh, hotels. Also, I think Google Flights is the best uh, flight booker right now. Again, it's kind of debatable, but Google Flights, Hotels.com. Can't go wrong with that mixture. Also, I'm apparently flying from London Luton Airport. I just realized I gotta, gotta, gotta rework my plans around that one. If you're curious, I'm going to Scotland for a day. I'm coming back at the end, don't worry. So yeah, fun fact, I learned something new from this video and hopefully you did too, because I'll see you all next time. Second channel, don't care. Goodbye.